Hi guys, after having read your responses for Helene Johnson's sonnet to a Negro in Harlem, um, I just wanted to address some concerns. So it didn't seem like many of us felt confident about what we were writing for our answers. And so I'm making the assumption that not many of us understood this sonnet. So I just wanna briefly go over what's going on, okay? Um, and I wanna address some concerns. So first and foremost, we have a speaker and a subject, both of whom we do not know the gender of, okay? So you cannot assume that ever, and not just for this poem, but in any poem, that the author is the speaker, okay? So I'm a woman, if I wrote a poem, I could write a poem from a man's perspective, right? So you can never assume that the speaker of the poem is the author. So we're gonna just call the speaker the speaker, and if we're going to need to use a pronoun to describe him or her, we will do it just like that. So we will say he or she, him or her. And the same goes for the subject of the poem. So what do I mean by the subject of the poem? The subject of the poem is the person who the speaker is admiring or talking about throughout this sonnet. Now remember, a sonnet is a love poem, right? So really he or she is admiring the subject, not only for his or her physical stature, okay, and power and confidence, um, but also for kind of this arrogance and this, um, I guess, just confidence that he or she is exuding, okay? This would be important, I think, okay, because at the time, African Americans had been belittled, right? So um, it's a way of asserting strength and power, right? Yes, there might be some arrogance and you and I might not describe the person who we most admire in that way, but because of what African Americans had been enduring at the time, they were trying to assert their their value, right? And so it seems that the subject of this poem doesn't have any type of doubt that he is or she is great, right? So let me just walk you through the poem again, okay? So again, the speaker admiring says, you are disdainful and magnificent. So right off the bat, right? Disdainful, full of anger, and yet also magnificent. She is admiring, I keep saying she, just like I said not to, but she or he is admiring this person's um, hatred that he or she possesses, okay? Your body is perfect, right? Your pompous gait, right? The way you walk even is confident. Your eyes are dark and flashing seriously, solemnly, is very serious and formal with hate. Okay, so now since this is probably about an African-American person, um, I'm going to just say that I picture, when I read this line, I picture like a very handsome African-American man who flashes with a very serious look, his eyes, in your direction, okay? S somebody who you want to take seriously, somebody who is almost scary, right? Like, in that they carry themselves to be such a leader, okay? So I want you to try to imagine in your head somebody that makes eye contact in that way, okay? And maybe with some hatred, right? At the time, it, I think hatred would be justified, okay? H hatred is something that um, it's hard to blame African Americans for feeling towards white people um, when they had been treated with such horrific um, scorn and prejudice, right? Continuing on, the speaker says, it's a small wonder that you are incompetent to imita imitate those whom you so despise. So this is interesting because incompetent is often thought of as a word that describes somebody who's not capable of doing something, right? However, here it's turned into a positive small wonder that you don't want to, right? You don't feel the need to try to imitate the white, you know, white folk and, and behave like they do. You do your own thing, right? And that is something, again, of admiration to the speaker, okay? 
he or she goes on to say that your shoulders are towering high above the throng. Okay, this person is very tall and powerful. Their head is thrown back in rich, barbaric song. Palm trees and mangoes stretched before your eyes. So I love these lines, right? Think about um, a person who is able to walk down the halls, right? Um, with their head back, singing a song aloud. I know that I am not one who will, you know, just be singing casually, right? I'm a little bit more reserved than that. But a person who is comfortable singing a song aloud, nonetheless, a song that is considered by many people to be barbaric at this time, right? So um, perhaps it's an African song, okay? And then the speaker also says, palm trees and mangoes are stretched before your eyes. Again, I said this in my initial instruction for this poem. This is not literal, right? What this person sees as he or she walks down the street with his or head, her head thrown back singing is palm trees and mangoes in front of them. They're not seeing, you know, the negative. The, the the poverty, perhaps, and the ugliness of the city and the existence of racism all around and segregation, okay? He or she sees, rather, palm trees and mangoes, which is indicative of a tropic location, right? It's beautiful. Let others toil and sweat for labor's sake and wring from grasping hands their need of gold. So, this is where the sestet begins, okay? And so there is a little bit of a shift here. The speaker is saying, almost in the perspective of the subject, right? Yeah, just let other people work really hard, okay? There's no need for you to do anything because you are perfect just the way that you are and you know that, right? So that sense of confidence and that I, I called it complacency, but it's not complacency because it's more um, satisfaction and pride, okay, that this person seems to carry as he or she goes about his business. Um, now, this line tripped me up a little bit. Scorn will efface each footprint that you make. So it took me a while, and I kept thinking back and forth about this line, Right. But this type of a person, no doubt, is going to leave a footprint. Right. Um, and I think because of the time period, again, you have to read these things within the context of when they were published. And this was published in 1927. Um, he, this person might leave a footprint. However, scorn and perhaps scorn is the anger of the society is going to wipe away those footprints. So why bother? right? Why try to prove yourself to a society that's never going to appreciate it anyway, right? And then the last two lines, okay? I love your laughter, arrogant and bold. She or he is admiring that laughter, that happiness, that kind of, I would say, even laugh at the white culture at this time that had be belittled African Americans, okay? You are too splendid for this city street, okay? Again, speaker admiring and saying, hey, you're too good for this place, right? Like, you know it too. And I think that there is a sort of power that Helene Johnson re, um, reclaims with the publish, publication of this poem, um, not only for herself, but I think for all African Americans. So I really love this poem. This is a poem that um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and say that the last poem that we read, Songs from Signare, not super obsessed with that poem. I think that it's really beautiful in that it celebrates Af African culture. Um, but for me, this one is really, really powerful and I really enjoyed it. So I hope that this analysis helped to clarify some things because I don't think many of us understood what this was all about, okay? And so if there's any questions, um, please comment below.